If you ask someone, what does flirting mean to you? How would you define it? More than likely, they would say, I know it when I see it, I know it when I do it, and I know it when someone flirts with me. Really? How sure are you? The source of all wisdom, Wikipedia, tells us the following. Flirting or coquetry is a social and sexual behavior involving spoken or written communication as well as body language. It is either to suggest interest in a deeper relationship with another person, or, if done playfully, for amusement. It usually involves speaking and behaving in a way that suggests a mildly greater intimacy than the actual relationship between the parties would justify. Wow. There's a lot to, as they'd say nowadays, unpack here. Let's begin with the statement that flirting is a social and sexual behavior. There has been a fair amount of research as to why people flirt. However, before we dive into that, let's think for a moment about flirting as a sexual behavior. If people flirt because they want to have sex, why do people want to have sex? Got you there. As usual, the psychologists have a lot to say about that, and not just on a theoretical basis as our sponsor, French psychoanalyst Jacques Lacan, has done. In a groundbreaking study by Cindy M. Meston of the Department of Psychology, University of Texas, Austin, and David Buss, entitled Why Humans Have Sex, they developed a questionnaire which includes every reason you could possibly imagine for having sex, and some you can't. It was a favor to someone. I wanted to have more sex than my friends. I was curious about my sexual abilities. The person was mysterious. Clearly a reason why women want to have sex with me, but I digress. I wanted to get a job. I wanted to feel used or degraded. I wanted to feel love. I wanted the person to feel good about herself. I wanted to gain control of the person. Interesting, hmm? I wanted to make sure that the person was committed to me. Of course, that could backfire. I wanted to decrease my partner's desire to have sex with someone else. I wanted to burn calories. I wanted to give someone else a sexually transmitted disease such as HIV or herpes. Gosh, ah, people have sex for that reason? I wanted to hurt or humiliate the person I was having sex with. The person smelled nice. I thought it would help me to fall asleep. And I wanted to get closer to God. I could make another bad joke and suggest that this is another reason why women want to have sex with me. Hopefully no one out there is listening too carefully. That having been said, Meston and Buss could identify only this one item which associated sex with spirituality. Ever since the beginning of the New Age movement, or train of thought, or whatever, authorities have been saying either, you will have better sex if you approach it as a spiritual act, or sex can be a way to enhance your spirituality. And yet, this New Age view appears to have had little impact on the sample Meston and Buss used in their research. I offer this as a challenge to my viewers. Why do you, presumably as a human, have sex or want to have sex? Another, possibly even more difficult question to ask yourself might be, what are the right and wrong reasons for having sex or for wanting to have sex? On Meston's questionnaire, they include, I felt rebellious. But rebellious against what? The religious values you were brought up with? Or against the parental or societal precept that you should save yourself for marriage? A brief divigation will be imposed on you here. Over 30 years ago, J.A. Simpson and S.W. Grenenstad developed what they called a sexual orientation inventory. This could and can be administered to psych students and others to determine something about their sexuality. Basically, in old-fashioned parlance, how permissive they are. All of the listeners to Explore Aesthetic Sensuality should take this test. Test questions include how many partners, 
have you had sex, intercourse or oral sex, with in the past year? With how many partners will you probably have sex, intercourse or oral, over the next five years? How many partners have you had sexual intercourse or oral sex on a one and only one occasion basis? In this connection, I highly recommend our popular and award-winning episode entitled The Joy of Casual Sex, Hookups, Booty Calls, Sports Sex, One Night Stands. Who needs a relationship when you can have it all? That episode is here on Spotify, YouTube, and everywhere fine podcasts are sold. When in a stable, committed relationship, How often would you fantasize about sex with someone other than your current partner? And sex without love is okay. Our version of the sexual orientation inventory might include, in addition, love without sex is okay. Or, how many times have you had sex, intercourse or oral sex, with someone for whom you felt no attraction for or interest in whatsoever? In other words, you're having sex just to have sex. Or, how many times have you had sex in the presence of other people? Kind of interesting questions. But uh, not in Simpson and Gangestad's inventory. Which, I remind you again, was developed over 30 years ago. Times change. Talking about such things, I highly recommend our other award-winning, highly popular episode entitled Monogamy, Swapping, Swinging, Open Relationships, Threesomes, The Lifestyle. Which one of these is right for you? To return to why humans have sex, here, according to them, are the most frequently endorsed reasons for having intercourse. Number one pure attraction to the other person in general. Two, experiencing physical pleasure. Three, as an expression of love. Four, having sex because of feeling desire for someone. Having sex because of feeling desired by someone. Five, having sex to escalate the depth of the relationship. 6. Curiosity, seeking out new experiences. 7. Making a special occasion for celebration. 8. Mere opportunity. And 9. Sex just happening to the seemingly uncontrollable circumstances. Suffice it to say that procreation, I want to make a baby, as John Cassavetti says to Mia Farrow in the movie Rosemary a Baby, was not listed in Meston and Buss's questionnaire. To hold on to him by getting pregnant was not an item people could choose. Neither was to hold on to her by getting her pregnant. How often, it seems to us, do psychologists leave unexplored crucial aspects of relationship and sexual dynamics? A quick thought here. Singers, female and male, pop, jazz and opera, you name it, have been flirting with their listeners since the dawn of time, or even before. Certain singers, big confession here on my part, raise my level of sexual excitation. Miley Cyrus is a prime example, but since she's my girlfriend, I guess that's okay. Prudes tell us that we live in a highly sexualized era, thanks, as they tell us, to mass media. One imagines that there might have been studies on how flirting styles presented in pop cultures have affected our behavior. And indeed, there have been such studies. More on this later. Having explained the reasons why people have sex or want to have sex, and having asked you the reasons why you want to have sex or want to have sex, we are now going to turn to the question of why do people flirt something which we will be discussing throughout this episode. In other words, what are an individual's motivations for flirting? To begin with, by referencing an article entitled Flirting with Meaning, an Examination of Miscommunication in Flirting Interactions by David Dryden Henningsen, published in the journal Sex Research. Summarizing the literature on the subject, Henningsen boiled down the reasons why people flirt into six categories. Sex fun, exploring, 
relational, esteem, and instrumental. Relational here means someone is flirting because they're interested in the developing of a potential relationship. Esteem means that someone is flirting to increase their self-esteem. If he responds to my flirting with him, that will make me feel better about myself. Likewise, same for a woman. If she responds to my flirting with her, it will make me feel better as myself, because after all, she is responding. Instrumental means that you are flirting because you want something from the person you are flirting with. If I flirt with him, he is more likely to write a letter of recommendation for me. In Henningsen's study, gender differences emerge for several flirting motivations, i.e. sex, relational, and fun. Men tend to view flirting as more sexual than women do and women attribute more relational and fun motivations to flirting interactions than do men. No gender differences emerge for esteem, exploring, or instrumental motivations. There exists a common misconception that women are more likely to flirt with men to get something out of them, money, a new car, a job, than men flirt with women for those reasons. That turns out not to be the case. I promised that I would tell you both how people flirt and which flirting styles and strategies are the most successful. Jeffrey A. Hall of the University of Kansas and his fellow researchers from the University of Southern California published an article in Communication Quarterly entitled Individual Differences in the Communication of Romantic Interest, Development of the Flirting Styles Inventory in which they tell us that there are five styles of communicating romantic interest in others. Traditional, physical, sincere, playful, and polite. Exploratory and confirmatory factor analyses on a large adult sample, 5,020 humans, supported the existence of these styles. Styles predictably correspond with self-monitoring and a five-factor personality model, which we shall discuss a bit later. Women scored higher on all styles except the playful style. The physical, sincere, and playful styles correlated with more dating success. The physical and sincere styles correlated with rapid relational escalation of important relationships with more emotional connection and greater physical chemistry. So there it is in a nutshell. All you got to do if you want to flirt successfully is to be physical, sincere, and playful. Politeness doesn't make it. Being traditional doesn't make it either. I must say you're looking splendid this evening, Miss Woodhouse. is unlikely to get you anywhere. Hall et al. have defined their traditional flirting style as adherence to traditional gendered scripts, such as Men make the first move, and women are more passive participants. In a paper by Oswald, Clark, and Paterson, we will be discussing later, these psychologists state, quote, Obviously, this script cannot be applied to a same-sex dyad. Unquote. I leave it to our many non-binary viewers to comment on this. I have lesbian friends who always make the first move and never respond if another woman makes a move on them. And these women are not necessarily butch. However, Oswald Clark and Paterson's research showed that the predominance of lesbian women opting for the non-initiator role suggests that lesbians and straight women flirt in the same fashion, both typically fulfilling a passive, traditionally feminine script. Again, comments from my non-binary viewers will be greatly appreciated. At this juncture, I'm beginning to get the idea that there are flirting activities, strategies, and styles I have observed, but that these shrinks and anthropologists have not noticed. Susan A. Spear, a senior lecturer in psychology, University of Manchester, discusses the use of what she calls improprieties in flirting or in speed dating contexts. Studies she refers to, quote, have advanced our understanding of the range of interactional practices that may be considered flirting, including flattery, insults, playful banter, sexual improprieties, or innuendo, and teasing. 
According to her, the recipients of such improprieties often treat them not as adversarial, but rather as an indirect means of establishing repartee or as a flirtatious bid. Teasing is often not flattering or complimentary. It can be, and frequently is, quite the contrary. What it does is to break down a barrier of social or status differences, for example. It's a way of saying, I'm intimate enough with you that I can tease you about your wrong pronunciation of a word or about your hairstyle. I get teased about that all the time by women who are flirting with me. Good reason to have a sloppy hairstyle. There is also the matter of how people perceive what has been called flirtatious communication, which raises the question as to whether flirting is mainly about yourself, it's just a way to have fun, I'm not trying to communicate anything special when I am flirting, or whether flirting has a message. In an article published in the Journal of Sex Research, Matthew F. Abrahams of Northern Illinois University asked the following questions. A. What perceptual dimensions underlie flirtatiousness judgments? B. Do men and women use similar perceptual dimensions in assessing flirtatiousness? And C. Do men and women vary in the degree to which they employ these perceptual dimensions in making their judgment? To put this in layman's terms, and when it comes to sex, are we not all laymen? Well, most of us. How can I tell if someone is flirting with me? What am I looking for to determine if that gorgeous babe I'm speaking with at a party is flirting or is just passing the time? What Abraham's discovered is that what people are looking for to determine if someone is flirting with them are the other person's sexual assertiveness, overtness, invitation, playfulness, non-verbalness, and unconventionality. Furthermore, men and women use identical dimensions in assessing flirtatiousness. Why mate choices are not as reciprocal as we assume. The role of personality, flirting, and physical attractiveness. Quite a mouthful. This is the title of a study by Mitya D. Bach and a bunch of other German psychologists published in the European Journal of Psychology. In our modern society, we assume that people who are married or who are in relationships have chosen each other. Bach and her colleagues remind us that often enough people are left with the impression of reciprocated interest and are disillusioned later on. They point to prior research which has shown that uniquely choosing a specific dating partner seems to be only weakly reciprocated. I look at my friends Adrian and Don, who have been dating for a while, and think that they have chosen each other, but that is very seldom the case. Either Adrian shows Don as a unique guy to go out with, or Don shows Adrian. It is statistically unlikely that they chose each other. The results of box study confirmed that actual mate choices are not reciprocal, although people strongly expect their choices will be reciprocated, and flirting behavior is indeed strongly reciprocal. So, when you're flirting, the flirtatiousness, flirting behavior is reciprocal. But does that mean that your choice of a mate is reciprocal? Your choice of a boyfriend or girlfriend is reciprocal? Well, that turns out not to be true. With people who are married or are in relationships, their choices were unlikely to have been reciprocal. Put that on your proverbial pipe and smoke it. Or hookah, if you prefer. Okay. Flirting takes place in time. <laughs> Big surprise. So it is perhaps useful to talk not just about flirting in and of itself, but about flirting episodes. What happens during a flirting episode? Carl Grammer of the Ludwig Boltzmann Institute in Vienna set up situations in which young people of opposite sexes were alone in contexts akin to waiting rooms, somewhere, anywhere, then watched what happened over the course of ten minutes. In the first minute of these interactions, neither female solicitation behavior nor negative behavior is strongly related to professed interest in the man. Although the rate of female courtship-like behavior is significantly higher in the first minute, 
It is only in the fourth to tenth minute that the rate of female courtship-like behavior is correlated with professed female interest. That is to say, how actually interested the woman is in the man. Solicitation behavior <laughs> sounds a bit like, I don't know, an invitation. But actually what these Austrian shrinks and anthropologists are talking about are things like shrugging and hair tossing and hair flipping. So if a woman is interested in a man, what is she more likely to do? She is most likely to primp, give a coy smile, or illustrate what she is saying by moving her hands. And she is least likely to flip or toss her hair and to flex her arms. One wonders how many men know how to read these signals. Well, after having listened to this podcast, now you do. Oh, you should probably also know what signals in terms of body language a woman will give you if she has negative interest in you. Four of these negative signals prove to be statistically significant. The woman closes her legs, moves her legs, or crosses her legs. Now, this is my conclusion and not Carl Grammer's. However, this is female behavior which indicates that she is guarding herself, and particularly guarding her genital area, or in the case of moving her legs, that she is signaling a desire to flee from the situation. But back to Hall et al. For many years, personality psychologists have been using a five-factor model in determining what kinds of personality you have. The factors are extroversion, agreeableness, conscientiousness, neuroticism, and openness, sometimes called openness to new experience. Stubborn people are not going to rate very high in agreeableness. People who tend to be laid back, less goal-oriented, and less driven by success, and even who engage in antisocial and criminal behavior are not going to rate high on conscientiousness. You get the general idea. For women and for men, the physical flirting style is positively related to extroversion and openness, that is to say, openness to new experience. The physical style was also positively correlated with agreeableness and conscientiousness and negatively related to neuroticism. Translation, nice people are likely to flirt physically. The playful flirting style is positively related to the physical style and negatively related to the polite style for both men and women. The traditional style, on the other hand, is positively related to neuroticism for women. Jeffrey Hall, et al., also looked at an extremely interesting aspect of human personality known in psych circles as self-monitoring. Self-monitoring is measured on two scales. The actor-directed scale measures the ability to put on a social performance, whereas the other-directed scale evaluates the degree to which individuals modify their behavior for the benefit of others or in differing contexts. Suggestion. Rate yourself. Which one of these are you? Are you a person who puts on a social performance regardless of who you're with and what's going on? Or are you someone who modifies their behavior according to who you're with and where you are? It's a continuum, of course, but which end of the scale would you be closest to? As far as flirting is concerned, the physical flirting style is positively related to a self-monitoring actor which indicates those who are comfortable expressing their sexual interest in others are able to put on a good social performance. Makes sense. For women, the physical style is negatively related to a self-monitoring other, which suggests a reticence on the part of women to change behavior for the benefit of others. Got that? Repeating which suggests a reticence on the part of women to change their behavior for the benefit of others. A lot to wrap your head around so early in this episode, but let us continue. Way back in 1978, God, so long before I was born, but we'll go back there anyway just for fun, David B. Givens, then a consulting anthropologist at the University of Wisconsin, wrote a highly influential paper in the journal Psychiatry entitled the nonverbal basis of attraction, flirtation, courtship, and seduction. We take the liberty of quoting him. The nonverbal mode, more powerful than the verbal for expressing such contingencies in social relationships as liking, 
disliking, superiority, timidity, fear, and so on, appears to be rooted firmly in man's zoological heritage. Paralleling a vertebrate-wide plan, human courtship receptivity often relies on nonverbal signs of submissiveness, meekness, harmlessness, and affiliation, willingness to form a social bond. Adoption of a submissive, affiliative social pose enables a person to convey an engaging, non-threatening image that tends to attract potential mates. Unquote. Uh, okay, let's take a moment to talk about nonverbal flirting, a subject to which we shall doubtless return throughout this episode. We refer to an article by Parnia Haj Mohammadi of Cornell University, Omri Giloth, and Erica L. Rosenberg, entitled Identifying a Facial Expression of Flirtation and Its Effect on Men, published in the Journal of Sex Research. They begin by telling us that nonverbal flirting behaviors, such as sustained eye contact, smiling, coy gazing, and self touching, were already found to play an important role in the initiation of courtship and that women, for evolutionary reasons, need to be more selective than men in choosing partners. <laughs> I can vouch for that. To enable selectivity, women should be able to control, at least to some extent, the initial interaction in opposite-sex encounters. This allows a woman to choose who would be encouraged to interact with her and to what extent the interaction would be allowed to proceed. Hence, a woman who uses cues to increase the likelihood of a man's approach while testing the waters would have an advantage over women who do not use such cues. From an evolutionary perspective, women would have been expected to have developed such cues, cues that manifest as flirting behavior. Men, conversely, had a different set of challenges to cope with throughout evolution and hence developed the different mating goals and strategies. From an evolutionary perspective, selectivity is less important for men. Their main goal is to avoid missed mating opportunity. For men, every mating opportunity can potentially result in the obtainment of their ultimate evolutionary goal, passing on their genes. Missing such opportunities carries a genetic cost. Therefore, Men are expected to be highly motivated to detect signs of interest that are conveyed by women. At the same time, courting a woman who is not interested can result in negative outcomes such as rejection, wasted resources, and even retaliation. Men, therefore, tend to avoid these potential negative outcomes by being as accurate as possible in identifying women's cues of interest. However, consider this in light of what Ellen Berscheidt and Elaine and William Volster point out in their study, Physical Attractiveness and Dating Choice, published in the journal Experimental and Social Psychology. To wit, an individual's own level of physical attractiveness affects neither his or her liking for his or her date, nor his tendency to ask that date out a second time. Everyone, regardless of his own level of physical attractiveness, like best and often ask out the extraordinarily attractive dates. Unattractive dates were aware that their extremely attractive dates did not like them as much as dates more similar in appearance, but this did not affect their preference or behavior. The solution here, as we have proposed in our award-winning hit episode, The Ugly Person's Guide to How to Get Laid is to learn to become attracted to other unattractive people. We have proposed a five-step program to love, which teaches you exactly how to do that. As far as attractiveness is concerned, it is extremely important to note that physical attractiveness, particularly observer-rated facial attractiveness, is often found to be the most powerful predictor of popularity. Before we return to Haj Mohammadi, Gillis, and Rosenberg's study in facial expression, let us share with you one more tidbit from Berscheidt and Levalsters. By self-cathexis is meant an individual satisfaction with their characteristics other than those related to their body, which is body cathexis. Self-cathexis factors are things along the lines of personality, creativity, and intelligence level. 
No, self-cathexis items bore a relationship to their physical attractiveness for men. However, the more physically attractive a man is, the less importance he places on intelligence as an asset. Got that? The more physically attractive a man is, the less importance he places on intelligence as an asset. So, all you brilliant but unattractive nerds out there, those chiseled hunks that the babes like, are looking down their perfect noses at you. Probably even more than the babes are. As an interesting gender context, as far as self cathexis factors are concerned, physically attractive women report more satisfaction with their general popularity, their leadership ability, and their degree of self-consciousness. However, they report more dissatisfaction with their degree of self-understanding than unattractive women do. Let that sink in for a moment. Internal states may be conveyed to others non-verbally through facial expression. These researchers investigated the existence of a particular facial cue that could be effectively used by women to indicate interest in a man. Across six studies, men could generally recognize a female facial expression as representing flirting. Flirtatious expressions receiving low recognition by men differed in morphology from the highly recognized flirting expressions. The discrepancies are indicative of individual differences among women in effectively conveying a flirtatious facial cue and among men in recognizing this cue. The morphology of the highly recognized flirtatious expressions coded using Facial Expression Coding System, or FACS, included a head turned to one side and tilted down slightly, and eyes turned forward, that is to say, toward the implied target. Results from experimental studies showed that flirtatious facial expressions, as compared with happy or neutral expressions, led to faster identification of sex words by the men. These findings support the role of flirtatious expression in communication and mating initiation. Let's continue thinking about how women flirt and why. I saw him first, competitive nonverbal flirting among women, the tactics used, and their perceived effectiveness, is an article written by T. Joel Wade, Marianne L. Fisher, and Elizabeth Clark of Bucknell University and the Kinsey Institute. These researchers explored nonverbal actions women use to flirt competitively against each other for purposes of accessing a mate. Mate is their term and gives either a procreative or a relationship slant on things. We would substitute for the word mate a man to go out with and maybe have a roll in the hay with. Not someone to, you know, mate with for life or anything like that. They also investigated the perceived effectiveness of these competitive flirting actions. Using act nomination, their first study yielded 11 actions, to wit, eye contact with the man, dancing in his line of sight, smiling at him, touching him, giggling at his jokes, butting in between the other women and the man, showing distaste for such another woman, brushing against him, hugging him, flirting with other men, waving to him for competitive flirtation against other women. Actions that signal possession were predicted to be perceived as the most effective. Results showed the most effective actions were touching him, initiating eye contact, hugging him, giggling at his jokes, butting in between him and the rival woman. Look at me. I'm a very attractive, flirty kind of guy, so I know what all of this is about. When I go somewhere with a woman, she is always trying to fend off other women who are trying to flirt with me. So my date uses all of these strategies, touching me in all sorts of places, let's just say, to tell other interested females, hey, babes, he's mine. We have already laid out the five flirting styles, physical, traditional, sincere, polite, and playful. Jeffrey A. Hall, again, this time with Chong Ching, were interested in which nonverbal and verbal behaviors were associated with each of these styles. What they determined was that each flirting style was correlated with behaviors linked to the conceptualization of that style. More conversational fluency for physical flirts. More demure behaviors for traditional female flirts. And more assertive and open behaviors by traditional male flirts. 
Less fidgeting, teasing, and distraction, and more smiling for sincere flirts. More reserved and distancing behavior by polite flirts. And more obviously engaging in flirtatious behavior by playful flirts. For those of you who are in what they call a relationship, the R word, as we call it here, and explore ecstatic sensuality, the issue inevitably arises. Just because I'm in the R word with Florinda, does that mean that I don't get to flirt anymore? The amount of women in London who flirt with their own husbands is perfectly scandalous. It looks so bad. It is simply washing one's clean linen in public. Or so said Oscar Wilde in The Importance of Being Earnest. But what about extra relationship flirting? We get to talk about both this and chat GPT at the same time. How cool can that be? Biting the forbidden fruit. The effect of flirting with a virtual agent on attraction to real alternative and existing partners is the tasty title of an article by Gurit E. Birnbaum of Ryman University, Israel, Rail Archen, Kobe Zlotek et al., published in 2023 in Current Research in Ecological and Social Psychology. I'm going to quote them and ask you, my listeners, if you agree or not. Romantically involved individuals are more likely than single individuals to be inattentive to potential alternative partners, to devalue their attractiveness, to remember more negative and fewer positive behaviors enacted by these potential partners, and to show disinterest in interacting with them. Which do I get from you? A shrug of the shoulder, a titter, or a nod of agreement? Now, following from this, they say, inoculation theory proposed that exposure to a weakened threat can promote self-control by allowing people to contemplate resistance. Birnbaum et al. investigated whether exposure to a weak relationship threat, in their case flirtation with a virtual human, would inoculate people who were involved in committed relationships against the enticement of real-world alternatives by enhancing their desire for their current partners. Their theory was that exposure to a weakened threat is likely to remind them of their long-term commitments. Fantasizing about someone other than a current partner is not necessarily a threat to current relationship, but may help sustain desire for current partners. These authors hypothesize that a virtual flirtatious encounter may prepare people to raise their guard more quickly against a threat from a real-life flirtatious and potentially relationship-threatening individual. In their experiments involving university students in Israel, Birnbaum and her associates determine that flirtatious encounters with a virtual human can inoculate romantically involved individuals against the appeal of real alternative partners. These participants experience both guilt and higher desire for their current real-life partners. And thus, we pre-introduce another new product in our Mr. Sensuality line the Mr. Sensuality Flirtation Inoculation app. Gals out there, if you're in a relationship and you are worried that your guy or hubby is going to stray, require him to spend half an hour on this app flirting with a virtual Miley Cyrus. After doing so, he will feel guilty. He will not be attracted to real-life tempting women he may brush up against, and he will have more desire for you. Consult with your investment advisor prior to investing. On the other hand, T.J. Wade and A.B. Weinstein published a study in the Journal of Social, Evolutionary, and Cultural Psychology entitled, Jealousy Induction, What Tactics Are Perceived as Most Effective? They report that individuals can induce jealousy in their current partner by using techniques that involve flirtation with an individual other than their partner. Why would someone in a relationship wish to induce jealousy, which is to say, make their boyfriend or girlfriend jealous, for example, by flirting? Wade and Weinstein explain that, according to evolutionary theory, for a woman, jealousy provided a way to ensure that her male partner is investing resources in raising her offspring. Jealousy also evolved to protect love from the threat of loss to a rival. 
So, while jealousy can lead to negative emotions, when it is properly used, it can also enhance relationships and provide mating benefits and enhance survival. I.e., it jealousy is an adaptive emotion. Jealousy evolved to help preserve the bond of love and defend it against interlopers. Not to go too far in the direction of psychobiology here, but we have the emotions we have for evolutionary reasons. And evolution means not only the survival of the species, but the betterment of the species. Because only if a species becomes better will it compete successfully with other species and survive. So we develop AI and it competes successfully against us. It is as if we were to genetically engineer a poisonous, flesh-devouring, maniacally reproductive vampire dog and set it loose in suburban America. There have been many artistic, literary, philosophical, and musical works dealing with flirtation and ensuing jealousy. One of these happens to be one of my favorite operas, Von Heute auf Morgen, by Arnold Schoenberg. The ideal happily married couple have returned home from a party at which the man and woman have flirted with other people. The woman flirted with a handsome operatic tenor who, by implication, embodied everything that her routine, reliable husband lacked. The husband raves about a woman they met there, a glamorous, sexy former friend of his wife. Now, back in their bourgeois living room, the couple begins to argue, and then the wife slowly begins a transformation into the sort of woman her husband had been flirting with, namely, glamorous and sexy. The man is fascinated and immediately wants to prove his newly ignited love to her. But she rejects him. She now wants to enjoy life and immediately have an affair with the singer. She bosses her husband around, tries to make him jealous and torment him. He fetches a bottle of beer for her from the cellar, but she smashes it on the ground. She sings and dances, waking up their child, who comes out of his room to check on the noise. She roughly pushes it away leaving her husband to comfort it and put it back to bed. When the gas man arrives at the door to demand payment for their bill, she wants to send him away, too, without paying. She now needs all the money for clothes and wants to live on credit like all decent people in the future. Just then, the handsome singer calls. He was walking past her apartment with his girlfriend, and they saw light through the blinds. But when he and his sexy woman companion arrive... They do not find the swapper swingers they perhaps expected. Instead, they find a peaceful marriage at all. They are disappointed that nothing will come of the hope for flirt. The man and the woman are probably not in a modern marriage after all. After the objects of their social lust have gone, the man and the woman and the child sit down at the breakfast table, and the woman sums it up. They may have faded as theater figures, while the others are still radiant in color. But with them, fashion rules. With them, even love. This does not change from one day to the next. Finally, the child curiously asks what modern people are. It is perhaps curious that the libretto of Von Heute F. Morgan was written by Schoenberg's wife under the pseudonym Max Blonda. I am tempted to write my own 2023 sequel in which our couple meet a sexy rock star and a sexy model at a party. When they visit our contemporary perfect couple, they find instead an orgy going on. But that's neither here nor there, neither today nor tomorrow. Relevant Explore Ecstatic Sensuality episodes include our highly popular episodes on fantasy. Yes, folks do fantasize about other people during sex, swinging, and polyamory, and, of course, cheating. True story. A woman once said to me, I'm not cheating. I'm just learning new bedroom skills you and I can try. Got that? Oh, uh, women. Men, too. Judy Burgoon, a professor of communication, family studies, and human development at the University of Arizona, conducted research and communication that led to the expectancy violation theory, which explains how people interpret body distance and eye contact in flirting. The theory states that people have basic expectations for behavior under a variety of circumstances. According to Dr. Eric Duff of Robo, professor in the Department of Applied Communication Studies at Southern Illinois University, Edwardsville, 
People have the ability to ask someone if they are romantically interested in them before even opening their mouths because flirting is often initiated through the subtle nonverbal signals sent and received. Body distance, which is known as proxemis, and eye contact are the two most important ways people send out these signals. So you walk around with the basic idea of what's the normal amount of distance between you and anybody else, Vrobel said, and that is your expectancy. One of the questions becomes, what happens when that expectancy gets violated, when you do something different than what is expected? You can look at that violation as either a positive violation or a negative violation. Positive violations come from people we are romantically interested in, in moving from a social distance to a closer, more intimate distance. Negative violations come from those we are not romantically interested in, encroaching on our space. You're basically making a request. Is it okay that I get that close? And then that person is going to gauge your response, Vrobel said. You can back up, you can get obviously uncomfortable, or you can do absolutely nothing, or even go so far as to smile. And in that way, you've kind of had a question that was asked and answered. Vrobel said if, for example, a person allows his or her leg to actually touch yours, your response will communicate your interest and drive his or her response. Now, if at the point you touch, you immediately recoil, back up, giggle embarrassed, ha ha, sorry, that's a very different from if you do nothing, Vrobel said. Your leg is up against his or her leg, and you just leave your leg there, and so does he or she. Suddenly, it's like the whole world is that warm spot on your leg. What's beautiful about this is that you never had to say anything. Freshman pre-nursing major Imam Krasha of Naperville said she often communicates her interests through touch. If they're talking and say something I like, I'll touch them gently, or I will ask to borrow something, like a pencil, or I'll swipe their hand, Krasha said. I must confess that this happens to me all the time. I report this in the context that I happen to be an extraordinarily attractive man whom women find achingly desirable. But still, one instance that comes to mind was when I was standing next to a woman friend of a friend who I scarcely knew. I was standing next to her for a group photo and I could feel her pressing her body against mine much more closely than I expected. And for the rest of the evening, there she was. Her hips and the sides of her breasts were pressing against me. We were both a little tipsy, she maybe more than I, but still. Later I asked my friend what this was all about. Was her friend Grace really flirting with me? What should I do? And my woman friend answered, she's just man crazy. <laughs> man crazy women like that I really want to get to know. Then there's flirting with the eyes. Senior mass communication major Cinnamon Stewart of Chicago said she tries to catch the eye of someone she may be interested in, and if she notices them staring, she knows they are interested too. I'm not really a flirter. I'm always the one being flirted with. I kind of wait and stand behind the scenes, and I'm real observant, Stewart said. I like to wait and see how other people come to me. Sophomore elementary education major Kaylee Braun of Misawa, Japan, said she has difficulty picking up on the more subtle side of flirting. Braun said that she does not consider herself to be a skilled flirter because she is shy. She usually tries to make it clear she is available for flirting by maintaining eye contact and doing something she picked up from the media. I don't really know if people are flirting with me. I feel that any guy who talks to me is flirting with me for some reason, Braun said. I definitely keep looking at them and give them an eyebrow raise. You know, typical movie stuff because I really don't know what I'm doing. Now, I'm going to give some real personal advice that may not be applicable to everyone, but as far as a guy who wants to flirt with a woman and really wants to have a kind of devastating effect on her. And it really helps to have really kind of deep-set, piercing, mysterious blue eyes are great, but I'm sure it doesn't really matter. But blue eyes are fantastic. I happen to have just amazing blue eyes. This has happened to me so many occasions. I will look at a woman with my eyes, really deeply and lovingly. There is such a thing as a loving look. I will see her shiver, and she will sometimes turn down her 
face and bat her eyes and say, stop looking at me that way. Or even say nothing. She doesn't, oh, yeah. But there's always this reaction. And when a woman reacts to you like that, you know she's in love with you. Not just, you know, the usual kind of superficial stuff, but you know that woman is in love with you. So, yes, flirting is interesting. It is both an art, a science, and a game. I keep returning to something I said in one of my last episodes. Foreplay is what happens between orgasms. Remember that this is explore ecstatic sensuality, and the sensuality is what we want you to experience to the max in everything you do. Break down those barriers between you and the marvelous things that are out there for you to see, touch, taste, and smell. Both the societal barriers, the moral barriers, and super-ego barriers hammered into your personality first by your parents and later by many others. As the brilliant Anita Di Francesca writes in her most recent book, Love Buzz, modesty is old-fashioned. If you've got it, flaunt it, flirt with it. Allow your ego to insult in the sunlight of sensuality. The more you allow yourself to be flirted with, the more beautiful individuals of your sexual preference will flirt with you. It's like my stories of women pushing their bodies against mine, or the countless example of women playing footsie with me, going back to the sixth grade, actually. Do not allow anyone to take the fun out of flirtation. Thus spake Mr. Sensuality. Some of you guys out there are probably chomping at the bit and saying stuff like, you promise to tell me ways to flirt that will get me laid, or that will get me to the altar ASAP with a wholesome woman who will remain barefoot and pregnant but still have time to join the junior league. Take your pick. Well, Lee Ann Renginger of the Ludwig Boltzmann Institute for Urban Ecology, University of Vienna, and her colleagues did a study on just that, or close to it, entitled Getting the Female Glance, Patterns and Consequences of Male Nonverbal Behavior in Courting Context. This was published in the peer-reviewed journal Evolution and Human Behavior. The first question of their study was, did contact successful males exhibit nonverbal patterns that were different from those who were contact unsuccessful? They predicted that male nonverbal behavior in courtship context might serve as a mate relevant signal, and that males who achieve contact with females may have frequently signaled attributes that females have been under evolutionary pressure to value. Significant differences were found in five catalog areas. Contact successful males exhibit a larger number of glances that are short and direct, more space maximization movements, more location changes, more non-reciprocated touches to surrounding males, and a smaller number of closed body movements as compared with non-contact successful males. So what are we talking about here? Within many social species, the most dominant member commands the largest space. This tendency has been documented in humans, as well as other animals, including the command of personal as well as physical space. In addition, maximizing the body space through actions such as stretching or extending the arms legs across adjacent chairs serves to make the male a larger, more conspicuous target, that is, target for female attention. Therefore, if you want to initiate flirting with a woman in a social setting, a party, a bar, maximize the space you take up in these ways, and also move around a lot. So what is this thing about closed body movements versus open body movements? Open body positions include outward limb movements that avoid crossing off the main body torso. Communication with a closed or constricted body position e.g. arms folded across the chest, are perceived as having less social power. Then, what is this business about non-reciprocated touch to surrounding males? Are you going to attract a woman's attention better if you paw the guys around you? Like, come on. But actually, non-reciprocal touch is often perceived as a dominant submission pattern, or status differential. Touchers are perceived as having more status and more social power than to those being touched, or those not touching at all. 
the male doing the touching will be more successful with females than the male who is being touched. In addition, males who reciprocate the touch of another male should be more successful with females than with males who only receive touch. Got it? Then let's ask, do the types of nonverbal behaviors guys display vary in relation to how attractive they find women in a social setting? Participants in their study with high attraction levels to the women had the most amounts of auto-manipulation targeting the body area, e.g. scratching the arm or shoulder, while those indicating low attraction levels had the least. Study participants with high levels of attraction exhibited more total glancing behaviors and more auto-manipulations targeting the beard growth area, rubbing the chin for example, than did those with low levels of attraction. Mr. Sensuality poses that women in social situations can use this research to understand if a guy is hot for them or not. If he rubs his chin, he probably is. When I'm with a hot babe, I certainly do. But what about nonverbal cues used by women? Research by Latoya Tisdale and Pavika Sheldon of the University of Alabama Huntsville determined that the nonverbal cues that women display when flirting are as follows. Smiling, eye contact, initiating a kiss, switching hips, laughing, playful hitting, playing coy, touching, talking to oneself, batting eyes, licking lips, twirling hair, labored breathing, provocative dancing, gawking, appearing helpless, waving, holding hands, forwardness, and hugging. Their research was based on having students watch the following films in which flirting might be said to occur. How Stella Got Her Groove Back, Hitch, Two Can Play That Game, Teen Spirit, Bachelorette, and Goon. Older movies were selected in an attempt to eliminate viewer bias. They might as well have chosen these movies on the basis of which films might be most likely to turn Mr. Sensuality off to the idea of sex altogether. But we continue. In 1976, Gerber and Gross put forth their cultivation theory, which states that high-frequency viewers of television are more susceptible to media messages and the belief that they are real and valid. Gerbner et al. argued that in a media-laden culture, the repeated viewing of mediated images plays a significant role in the enculturation of day-to-day interpersonal communication norms, including how we construct romantic relationships. This theory goes hand-in-hand with Tisdale and Sheldon's results. In their study, the most used cues by women's study participants were smiling, holding eye contact, initiating a kiss, and laughing. In the six movies, these cues were used 125 times collectively, and in their data from their focus groups, laughing was the number one cue noticed by men. This suggests a parallel between media messages and their validity. I may go so far as to suggest that cultural behavior norms are set by mass culture, not only by films and television, but also, and in a major way, by advertising and pop music. But then we are faced with a chicken or egg situation. Are movies reflecting behavior that the creators of those films have already observed? Or are they harbingers of such behavior? Or even framers, designers, and modelers of such behavior? As a person in the film industry, I know that's what I do all the time. I'm making movies to model your behavior, to tell you how to act and behave, and to tell you how to flirt. But unless they are exceptionally horny or downright psychotic, women who laugh must have something to laugh at. Other, I should say, than shitty rom-coms from ten years ago. In an article entitled Flirting Competence, an Experimental Study on Appropriate and Effective Opening Lines by Keith Weber, Alan K. Goodboy, and Jacob L. Kaanus, published in Communication Research Reports, These authors conducted an experiment to examine the appropriateness and effectiveness of five flirtatious opening lines enacted by a male participant to initiate conversation with a female participant. Video messages were constructed to represent the following opening lines. Direct introduction, direct compliments, humor attempts, cute, flippant lines, and third-party introductions. 
Results indicated that participants rated third-party introduction and direct introduction opening lines as the most appropriate, whereas third-party introduction was perceived as the most effective. Direct compliments, humor attempts, and cute flippant lines were rated as equally inappropriate and ineffective. So guys, if you're interested in uh, chatting up a woman, well, this, that's my advice to you. Just be direct about it. Don't try to be funny. Don't try to fl be flippant. Don't try to compliment her. It's less likely to work than if you say, hey, I'm Mr. Sensuality. I dig spending some time with you. That's my opening line. It always works. Just for contrast, let's look at an article entitled Humorability Reveals Intelligence, Predicts Mating Success, and is higher in males that Gil Greengross and Jeffrey Miller of the University of Mexico published in 2011 in the Smarty Pants journal Intelligence. In contrast to Weber, Goodboy, and Kayanis, these authors tell us that a good sense of humor is sexually attractive, perhaps because it reveals intelligence, creativity, and other good genes or good parent traits. If this is so, intelligence should predict humor production ability, which in turn should predict mating success. In this study, 400 university students, 200 men, 200 women, completed measures of abstract reasoning, verbal intelligence, humor production ability, rated funniness of captions written for three cartoons, and mating success. Structural equation models showed that general and verbal intelligence both predict humor production ability which in turn predicts mating success, such as lifetime number of sexual partners. Let's stop for a moment to remind our listeners that mating success in this type of study does not mean that a guy ends up in an ideal stable marriage or a series thereof, but rather that he gets laid a lot over the course of his life. These shrinks also found that males showed higher average humor production ability than women. Their results suggest that the human sense of humor evolved at least partly through sexual selection as an intelligence indicator. Humor is an evolutionary enigma. People across cultures enjoy it with smiling, laughing, and mirth and socially value those who produce it. Yet, humor production seems to yield no survival benefit, and humor's ancestral origins and adaptive functions have been hotly debated since Darwin. Sexual selection offers one possible explanation for humor's origins. So let's get semi-vulgar here for a second and say that if you've got a good sense of humor, you stand a better chance of getting laid. <laughs> if you're a guy, that is to say. And so humor is a very good and valuable component of successful flirtation. Ask former stand-up comedian Mr. Sensuality. Just as there are good flirting techniques, good in that they get you, whether you be female or male, where you want to go, so there are bad, unsuccessful flirting techniques. And along the way, this raises the question, what happens to people who are lousy at flirting? Are they consigned forever to the dustbin of solitude? These questions, and others, were researched by Menelaus Apostolou and Chris Arratano at the Therio, University of Nicosia, Cyprus, and published in 2022 in the peer-reviewed journal Personality and Individual Differences. Why is it, if we may deign to ask, do pears get to review journal articles and not figs or grapefruits? Don't lose too much sleep over it, but this is a good question. By employing a sample of 587 Greek-speaking men and women, they found that more than 40% of the participants experienced difficulties in starting and or keeping an intimate relationship. They also found that poor flirting skills, poor mate signal detection ability, and high shyness were associated with poor performance in mating, especially with respect to starting an intimate relationship. The effect sizes and the odds ratios indicating that flirting skills had the largest effect on mating performance, followed by the mate signal detection ability, and last by shyness. Using a sample of 1,228 Greek-speaking participants, it was found that poor flirting skills were associated with an increased probability to be involuntarily single rather than being in an intimate relationship. Another study analyzed 6794 responses from a Reddit thread 
on why men were single and found poor flirting skills to be the fourth out of the 43 most frequent reasons for not having an intimate partner. In yet more research, based on a sample of 6,822 participants, 47.3 of the participants indicated poor flirting skills to be an important factor leading them to be single. In another study by Apostolo, Papadopoulou, and Jordiadu, published in 2019, these authors call our attention to recent research which indicates that almost one in two adult individuals experience difficulties in attracting and retaining a mate and were likely to experience prolonged spells of singlehood. Many people today lack a good capacity for flirting, which in the past, eras where many marriages were arranged, for example, would not have given them such a hard time finding mates, but in the present day, it does. You didn't have to flirt so much in um, In the Middle Ages? Well, sometimes in the past. In another study published in 2019, Apostolo, Irene Papadopoulou, and Michael Christofi begin by stating something which should be obvious, but for some of us is apparently not. Flirting would be successful if it manages to convey the message that the individual who engages in it has the qualities that the other person desires. I suppose that for a man, that could range from his status as a multi-millionaire to the length and girth down to the many millimeters of his erect penis. In this current research, they identified 47 traits which make flirting effective, and they classified them in nine broader categories. Having good nonverbal behavior, being intelligent, and having a gentle approach were rated as the most important factor. Sex differences were found for most of the factors. For example, women rated nonverbal behaviors and gentle approach to be more effective on them, while men related good looks as more effective. Women also ascribe more importance than men to controlling of and being willing to provide resources. So it all goes back to our Neanderthal ancestors, Zach in the cave. Different, at least in theory, from Plato's cave. Women will choose to sleep with and get into a relationship with a man who goes out and kills some poor saber-toothed tiger for dinner. Since this was probably before they knew how to make fire, that was likely to be saber-toothed tiger tartar or saber-toothed tiger carpaccio. Last but not least, older participants rated factors such as gentle approach to be more effective on them. So you senior cavemen out there, take notice. So we know what, at least in Nicosia Cyprus, works in terms of flirting. However, you might ask, what are flirting deal-breakers, as our Cypriot psychologists refer to them? In their research, they identified 69 acts and traits that were considered off-putting in flirting, and they classified them in 11 deal-breakers in flirting. Vulgar vocabulary, poor looks, excessive intimacy, lack of intelligence, narcissism, lack of humor, low self-esteem, stinginess, bad hygiene, slimy approach, different views, and lack of exclusive interest. They found that the most off-putting ones were a slimy approach, bad hygiene, and not demonstrating exclusive interest. They also found that female and older participants were more sensitive to the identified deal-breakers than male and younger participants. Different views is an interesting category. Might it not be good advice to keep politics out of flirtatious banter? Another reason for this might be the total unsexiness of almost all prominent politicians on the world stage. For me, Tulsi Gabbard would be a marked exception for this, but perhaps it is best to let that pass. A final question remains. What about clothing and the skimpiness, or even partial lack, thereof? Antonia Abbey and her colleagues performed a now-famous study in which they asked what males assumed about females wearing revealing versus non-revealing clothing, and vice versa, which is to say, what females assumed about males wearing revealing versus non-revealing clothes. Subjects were 287 Pennsylvania State University undergraduates. Female targets in the revealing clothing condition wore a low-cut blouse, a slit skirt, in high heel shoes. In the non-revealing clothing conditions, the female targets wore a blouse buttoned to the neck, a skirt without a slit, and boots. 
Well, boots can be a big turn on. We'll skip my little aside there. While more skin was visible in the revealing outfit, it was not so revealing as to be inappropriate classroom attire. Male targets in the revealing clothing condition wore a shirt that had the top three buttons undone and tight-fitting slacks. In the non-revealing clothing conditions, the male targets wore a shirt buttoned to the neck and loose-fitting slacks. Both male and female targets, revealing and non-revealing outfits, were selected to be equally attractive and stylish, shrinks, of course, being notoriously adept as arbiters of style. Contrary to expectations, males were rated as being more flirtatious in non-revealing rather than in revealing clothes. A man was rated as being significantly more athletic, sophisticated and attractive, and marginally more cheerful and humorous, wearing non-revealing rather than revealing clothes. The revealingness of male targets' clothing did not increase females' ratings of their sexuality. While female targets were rated higher on the sexual traits of the revealing outfits, males were not. As the authors observed while trying to develop the stimulus material, there is little consensus among males or females as to what kind of clothing men wear to look sexy and what kind of men's clothing is revealing. Needless to say, fashion trends vary from year to year. Now, in 2023, lingerie-inspired looks inundated the runways this season. From exposed bralettes making a statement to silky slips designed with seductive lace paneling. As the lines between lingerie and ready-to-wear continue to blur, intimate details have emerged as a winner, with sheer fabrics dominating the trend. Parisian fashion houses such as Celine, Saint Laurent, Chloe, and Christian Dior all introduced sheer overlays and see-through clothing this season, ultimately revealing the art of layering through subtle, sheer detailing. From Celine's feminine pussy bow blouses, Paired with a full skirt to Dior's embroidered and embellished gowns, styled over a bralette and high-waisted briefs, see-through clothing is meant to be worn beyond the bedroom. It simply relies on the styling. To tastefully wear sheer looks means to be precise in what you are layering under and over the transparent clothing. As for men... Over the course of this century so far, there have been a number of ways in which men express something about their sexuality by the way they dress. In her extraordinary new book, Love Buzz, psychologist, author, and tantra and relationship expert Anita DiFrancesco discusses sagging, where guys wear their pants at the hips and fashionably shows off their underwear, from plaids to whites to reds. She concludes, and I quote, I feel a sense of liberation in just watching the men this way. It's good in the eyes, just like men say breasts with cleavage is good in the eyes as well. So I feel a different liberation, like men have had for years, and now women have this. Far thinking on this, but it is what us women have been doing for years for the male, and now they are giving back. I feel free and relieved. I would like to see more corporate men try this on. Of course, on their off time. This is a way to let go and let your hair down. Let down the stress. Be free and create that happy balance between the rigid corporate world and the happy world. Loose clothing is more freeing and increases one's libido. Okay, guys, you're going to put away the Viagra. This trend will take you back where you once were. It's like going to a nudist camp, but in society. Not quite the same, but the effect is still there. So I conclude with this heartfelt message to my male and female viewers and listeners. Flirt up a storm. Flirting can get you where you want to go, whether that be the altar or just a fun, sexy, one-night stand. Or into a nice friends with benefits situation, as we discussed in our award-winning episode on casual sex. Or if you are more, how should we say, pragmatic, it might get you something purely material a job, a political endorsement, or it might get you a spiritual experience. Perhaps flirting is a spiritual experience. And if that's the case, far, 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 be it for me to put it down. Flirting is a promise of sexual intercourse without a guarantee. Milan Kundera, The Unbearable Likeness, 
of being. A few thoughts before we can say it's a wrap and send the crew home. You know, this huge crew that works with me on my podcast. They're feted, as always, on my set with champagne, caviar, and everything else they could possibly desire. So now they're ready to go out and party while I sit back and give my final thoughts in private to you, my listeners, my devoted listeners. One thing we brought up frequently, both in this episode and in other episodes, was accentuated and underlined today when we were talking about that amazing article by Ellen Bearscheidt and William Volstair. They discussed the fact that unattractive dates were aware that their extremely attractive dates that they went out with did not like them as much as dates of more similar appearance to themselves. Very, very important Attractiveness is numero uno, number one, as far as dating is concerned. Remember that. So I'm going to add to that a little small observation, which is to say, my mantra, everyone should learn from this podcast, is know your place. If you just say know your place several times a day, say it in your sleep, your mind will say know your place over and over and over again, you'll be happy. Like, who was it who said, don't worry, be happy? Was it Mayor Baba or Baba the Mayor or some other kind of dude? That's an important thing to remember. We talked about our five-step program to love several times. That this is something that we can't talk about often enough. Know your place. Because I'll tell you something that's extremely, extremely important. As we just said a moment ago, appearance is the thing. And if someone is out of your league, forget it. We did an episode on unrequited love. We talked about that in several episodes. Don't be in that position. It ain't going to work. It ain't going to work. If someone's more attractive than you, forget it. Ain't going to work. Attractiveness is a necessary component in terms of having a relationship. If a person is not attracted to you physically, then forget it. Move on and do something else with your life. Build ships and bottles. That's something people used to do. Do they still do that? I had no idea. There are many things you can do to take up your time other than have love, romance, and sex. That's not the only thing you can do. You may have a hard time thinking of others, but believe me, there are others out there. There really are. You just got to go and Go out and ask. Maybe you should put an ad on Craigslist saying, what the fuck should I do with my time? I'm never going to have love, sex, or relationships. I've got to find find something. I guess you could feed the hungry and clothe the naked, as the pharaohs used to say. You want to hear something really sad? Sad enough to break your heart? Well, I'll tell you. I'll tell you what a sad thing is. And you see it all the time. You see unattractive men or men who just aren't sexy. Maybe they exude this they exude this non-sexuality. Maybe there's something wrong with their bodies. They don't have enough testosterone or or they're so badly hung that no woman would find them satisfactory. Can you believe that? There are such men out there. You know, why aren't they out there playing checkers on some corner with some other idiotic-looking guy? But instead, a lot of them get into a thrall with beautiful women. And the beautiful women just love that. They dangle their boyfriends out in front of these really sexless guys. and they, But the sexless guys are just supposed to take it. It's like masochism. Masochism. And masochism, you know, there's, what well, they call them flogging and hitting and people, you know, people where, there are places where people just go to get spanked. As if the real world <laughs> did not inflict punishment enough on you. I don't know what to say. Whenever I see these guys, I'm a sort of person who's highly emotional. I am. Mr. Sensuality is highly emotional. 
And even when I see like an abandoned toy in the, on the sidewalk or even in the gutter, and I'm thinking there's a child somewhere who has been deprived of that toy, or there's a child somewhere. It's not just the starving masses in India or Armenia, wherever people starve nowadays. So it's the United States. That's where people starve nowadays. But there's a child somewhere who would hold that toy to his or, or her heart, who would love it and cherish it, for whom that toy, the little bear or panda, or even the small little game, or the small little set of blocks or something like that, whatever it is, and that, that little toy, that little thing, that little thing would give the child a sense of warmth and love and happiness. And yet there's the, there's the toy, there's the doll, the beloved object, lying, lying in, the, in the gutter. And there's the child with nothing. There's the child with nothing at all. When I was three years old, true story, when I was three years old, I had, I was diagnosed with, with polio. And I was put into, it was terrible. I was one of the late, latest people, the last people to have, to have polio. My parents didn't have me vaccinated or some kind of weird shit going on. So I was one of the very last and I remember, even to this day, that I, when I checked out of the hospital, I couldn't take my teddy bear with me. And I was really joyless until my parents took me out for Chinese food, and then I was all right again. But for some of you sad people, you sad guys who were in a thrall to beautiful women who would never give you a second chance, a second look, but they let you toil away because they know it's the only thing, the only way that you will ever be able to hang out with a beautiful woman. All right, we're going to move far, far, far away from that particular line of thought and talk for a moment about the ultimate, the ultimate flirting style. Back to flirting. I don't know if you've ever seen one of those like 1930s musical films starring people like Dick Powell. He was wonderful, but a whole bunch of other guys in addition, but he was maybe the best. And he would, you know, be kind of flirting a little bit with a girl, and he wouldn't necessarily be getting very far. He kind of frustrated. But what he would do is to break out in song. And here... Here's a little ditty that I've sung to girls all the time and over the years, and it always works. It doesn't really matter the things I do as long as I can do them with you. It doesn't really matter the things I do as long as I can do them with you. It doesn't really matter the things I say. We're saying the same things anyway. So it doesn't really matter the things I do as long as I can do them with you. If you are looking for professional counseling on matters relating to love, sex, and or relationships, we give our highest recommendation to Anita DeFrancesco, M.A. She is a highly educated and experienced love, sex, and relationship counselor, as well as being an advanced yogi and a somatic psychotherapist. Somatic representing the organomics of Dr. Wilhelm Reich. She is also the author of several extraordinary books. First, Live Free, Recreate and Liberate Your Life, which provides an introduction to Anita's patented therapy technique called kinepathics. Next is the Donna Gentili story, 
in case I disappear which is a spellbinding true crime thriller about the brutal murder of Anita's first cousin and Anita's own search for the killer, which sometimes subjected her to great danger. Then there is Express Yourself Yoga, an illustrated guide to the yoga positions and exercises which will do exactly that. Show you how to express, heal, and renew yourself through your body. And her latest book, Love Buzz. How to love, express it, and feel it. In Love Buzz, Anita writes eloquently about her own journey to love and how she has finally achieved it with her true flame. But that's not all. Anita may be found on Spotify, Amazon, YouTube, and all platforms with her own award-winning hit podcast, Discover Joyous Love, which I'm happy to say Anita has finally done in her own life. Mr. Sensuality says, hats off to Anita. We know that many years of celebrity and success lie ahead for her. 